Welcome to episode 29 of the Food Grads Podcast, the podcast where we explore careers in the food, beverage, and hospitality industries. I'm your host, Veronica Hislop, a molecular science graduate student and career partner with Food Grads. This week on the podcast, I interviewed Mark Wall, VP of Sales and co-owner of Sandy Shore Farms Limited, Canada's largest grower and shipper of fresh asparagus. In this episode, Mark spoke to me about the history of Sandy Shore Farms, how his family immigrated to Canada, and the story of the farm and its perseverance. I learned more about what Mark does as a VP of sales and why he decided to come back to the family farm despite going to, out of province for university. In addition, Mark talked to me about the story of asparagus and how it goes from the farm to your fork. What's interesting about fresh produce in comparison to ready-to-eat products like in canned goods or box goods is that produce has a very short shelf life in comparison and when things go wrong on the transportation side people like mark have to work very fast in order to come up with a solution to this problem which mark talks about in this episode and what he considers overall mark has a great attitude about things and you really feel that the advice that he gives is something that he goes by in life in this episode he really brings to light the current landscape of agriculture and how it's actually starting to kind of feel like a tech industry in some way but we'll get more into that in the episode that's why in today's landscape you don't have to be limited to the industries per se anymore instead it's better to focus on developing skills that you can apply in many ways because a lot of the skills that you can pick up from agriculture you can transfer to food manufacturing or vice versa even into the tech industry somehow <laughs> So enough with that introduction, let's get on with the show. Hello, Mark. Thanks for taking time out of your summer day to come speak with me on the podcast. I'm wanting to learn more about what you do and kind of dive more into the agricultural side of the food industry. I know I talk a lot to people in food manufacturing, processing, but of course we can't do all those things without the lovely produce that comes from farmers and those types of things. So thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Love sharing our story, my family story, and you know, sharing some of the challenges that we face as an agricultural industry. These types of things need to be talked about more in society. So it's, it's really my pleasure. Awesome. And I know that we're going to hopefully, I'm not hopefully, I know that we're going to address some of those things. I mean, being in Ontario, there's such a large agricultural base and it's hard to start, like, I know these issues are going to start getting talked about even more from just the consumer level, the non, the non-farmer, because, you know, yeah. you see it on the news and I think more people need to know. But before we get into all that type of stuff, we got to get first know a little bit more about you. I think we should get started by first learning more about Sandy Shore Farms. And I like to start off our guests by knowing a little bit about your career journey and what you do. Yeah. So let me start out by telling you a little bit of history about my family and, and how we kind of started this business here. So the Wall family farmed the, the Russian steppes, that's modern day Ukraine for many, many years. Interestingly, my grandpa's grandpa owned a brick factory as well as a paper mill there. And, but anyways, my great, great grandfather, originally from Holland, immigrated into Canada in the 1920s. They started farming in Niagara, mainly in orchard fruit. And then in the 1940s, my family moved their farming business in Norfolk and saw that opportunity to kind of grow the agricultural business here. And over time, we kind of realized that, you know, there's excellent potential to grow vegetables here in Norfolk. They call it the Norfolk sand plain. Norfolk is referred to as Cario's Garden. So my, my grandpa started to plant asparagus in the 1950s, 1960s, and the, and the business grew and grew. And my dad and my uncle took over and Slowly but surely, my dad and my uncle are, are moving out of the business and into retirement. And it's myself and my cousin taking the reins, taking on responsibility. And um, it's scary but exciting. Very, very fortunate to, to be in the position that we are. My dad and my uncle and, and you know, my grandpa, my grandpa's grandpa. I mean, this comes from a very, very long story of struggle and, and, and success. So, but... Right now, as Sandy Shore stands, we are a grower, packer, processor, and shipper of asparagus, bell pepper, and onion. We focus on value-added products, so we don't like to grow something. 
unless we can do something cool to it, add value. Asparagus, for example, we grow, grade, pack, and ship all over North America. But as far as, you know, what my job is here, I run sales, um, but I do wear a lot of different hats. It's, it's always unpredictable, and that's what I really like about it. But it's, it's about working together as a team. I really love my staff. They are one of the biggest reasons that I come to work each day. In agriculture, you're, you know, every day you're adapting to change, and whether that's in sales arrangements, logistical problem solving, it's, it's always different. Well, I grew up on the farm. Me and my friends, we used to call it the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all wanted to get out of the rural community and into the big cities because that's where all the, you know, the, the action was happening. But I went to university, spent my first year in Waterloo and transferred over to Concordia in, in Montreal. There I got my, my fill of the big city and I loved it. It was a great experience. I, at, at the end of it, I got my degree in political science. I feel like university teaches you how to analyze. It teaches you how to think. It's not necessarily you have to go and be in that field that you studied in. It's, it's more about you kind of gain that base knowledge of an, analyzing things and, and you know, working in teams and presenting. And at the end of my degree, I was ready to come home. The farm was calling me. I had my fill of the big city. So I came back and I thought, okay, you know, I'll kind of use this as a springboard to my career, whether that's in politics or, but I really started enjoying working in agriculture. One of the biggest reasons why I started enjoying is it's, it was the sense of being a part of a team and being a part of kind of a greater purpose. And I, a lot of it's also problem solving. Uh, there's so much that that gets thrown our way in the agriculture industry that you have to be good at problem solving and you have to be reactive. And I love problem solving. That is, yeah, it was, it was about it's that fulfillment through knowing that, that you're feeding people something very healthy. That, that was one thing that kind of, it was kind of like this this enlightenment that I had. I didn't really understand that growing up, but when I came back, I, I understood it. It's like, wow, what we're doing here is enhancing people's lives. And that's what life should be about. Wow. There's so many things and so many different places that I could take a conversation with what you said, <laughs> because, you know, you're talking about change, you're talking about agriculture. And like the first thing that stands up, like I mentioned before we talked is for me, I'm, I call myself suburbia. I don't quite call myself a city person, even though Mrs saga is because i do live in like the total suburbs yeah and for me like agriculture is totally out there for me in terms yeah. of like i don't have a family farm to call home and it's yeah. always been i've heard that people in rural areas want to get out see the city but i feel like for for someone like me i've always questioned do i want to go into agriculture because it's such a different thing for me and it's hard to imagine and so to hear that you kind of came to the realization to come back but as someone I can agree with, with university, it does teach you how to think. And I could imagine that applying those problem solving skills coming back, because again, we think of like technology being this new and exciting thing, but I was thinking about it. Like agriculture is, there, there's so much change that happens. You don't just, you know, it's not the same weather every day. You don't, you deal with different family, different, all these types of things. And I can see it being exciting if you just look at it from a good perspective. What's interesting is when we go and hire, we post job ads, it's not people locally here, typically, that, oh. that are applying. It's it's people from the city. There is there is a new interest, especially from big city in, in agriculture. People want to get involved. I've never heard that yet. So I've, I, <laughs> I, I was like, before we were here, I was like Googling like how to see how close I was to you. So yeah. I know exactly how far it is now from what you're saying. So that's really interesting. Do you happen to know what sparked their interest? I know that that might be diverting from your story, but I'm just curious. <laughs> well, I, I think it's, I think it has to do with the pandemic. People want to get out of the city and they want careers that are outside of the city. I know that's not everyone, but I think a good percentage of people have kind of change their mentality in that way where get out into the rural areas not be so condensed and, and crowded in cities and, and so this kind of provides them with that opportunity one thing that you mentioned earlier is that sandy shore farms is a family business and that is one of the things that you really enjoyed or kind of drew you back to coming home 
Um, can you talk to what that feels like? Or when you say family farms, does it mean like your whole family is involved? Is it just, you mentioned your cousin. How is that atmosphere? I'm one of four partners of the business here. So there's my dad, there's my uncle and my cousin. Working with family is, is difficult, but it also is really, really rewarding. And I always say, you know, we can disagree with one another, we can fight, we can have success together, but at the end of the day, we're always gonna be family. We're always gonna look out for each other. And that uh, that kind of creates a, a really cool bond within business. You know, it's like, no matter what, what problem comes our way, um, we're in this together. And if we fail, we fail together. If we succeed, we succeed together. So, so moving on to the role that you're doing, cause you are the VP of sales. What does your job actually look like? What do you do on a day to day, especially coming from a selling a product that is in its raw state, essentially. It's a constantly changing environment. Some days you have this, these, these these moments of excitement. So you have these good problems. You land that that contract with that customer to for peeled onions or for bell pepper for asparagus. And you just gotta figure out, okay, what are the logistics to achieve their spec, what what or to deliver what they need on time. Those are the good days, those are the good problems to have. There are also bad days where you know you're dealing with the inevitability of of late deliveries or Sometimes we're dealing with some off spec spec products, so you kind of have to adapt and, you know, look for different outlets and options for, for your product. So for example, customer can reduce their order size or it has, it has happened where a customer reduces their order size, but the product is already shipped and it's like, well, what do I do with that extra product? It's things like this where really have to be, and again, it's about problem solving and adapting and on the fly. Yeah. POs change on the fly. It's really frustrating. You have to figure out how to satisfy that customer who only wants, you know, that one or two pallets of product in Boston or Toronto. And, you know, how do you justify sending those pallets out that far? You got to fill that truck. So you're, you're getting on the phone and you're trying to sell product to fill that truck. In produce and raw produce, you are constantly racing against the, sh the shelf life of your product. And that's what makes it very, very challenging. For example, asparagus has a two week shelf life once, once harvested. So you have to get it into your facility, cool it down, grade it, pack it, ship it, and get it into the customer's door within that two weeks. And, and then, and then it's got to last, you know, a week on the shelf. So the same thing with bell pepper, you know, once processed, this stuff has four days of shelf life. You have to get that product to the customer before it goes bad on you. It, you're, you're constantly being chased with the, by the fear of your product going bad. It's challenging. So w with the right team in place, the right systems in place, it's manageable and, and yeah, it's difficult, but, but it's manageable and, and you can flourish if you do it correctly. Oh my gosh, I, I totally forgot. Like it didn't even occur to me. Yeah, the shelf, like selling like canned goods is especially yeah. different than a fresh produce. I forgot. Yeah, shelf life is actually a thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like if we were pumping out widgets here, sale didn't go through that I was expecting. Okay, well, just inventory it and we'll sell it elsewhere with asparagus or with vegetables. Order drops and all of a sudden you have this extra inventory. You know, you better get on the phone because because mm -hmm. that it's kind of like a ticking time bomb. Well, this might be a silly question, but I, I'm not aware. Um, when it comes to for your particular products, how does shipping actually happen? Is it just regular? Do you use like an outside company for picking up orders in their refrigerated trucks, or how is the process once it leaves the farm to like let's just say going to a standard grocery store? We'll load trucks up full of. Of uh, cases, Let, let's let's use the asparagus. Fruit. So I, I load a truck up full of asparagus. It then gets delivered to let's say a retailer's DC, a distribution center, and then the the DC accepts the product or they don't accept the product based on respect. And then from there, that DC they have trucks distributing to each and every store. At that point, the produce managers take the product and put it on the shelves. Okay. Okay. DC is distribution centers, correct? That's it. Well, one of the things you, I know you guys grow is asparagus and actually bell peppers. They're one of my favorite vegetables. I can eat bell peppers, like no problem as a snack. It's hands down, but you have to say asparagus is honestly my summer go-to every summer. I look oh, forward to, to hear. I look forward to Ontario. It, it, nothing tastes as good as Ontario asparagus. Music to my ears. We need more people like you. 
<laughs> oh, you should. I'm lucky. I go my um my boyfriend's family. His father's he's the summer produce guy, and like okay. when when it's in season, he's making sure that everyone eats it. But asparagus is my go-to, and I look forward to it because I get it from other places like Mexico or. And I just don't bother because it just does not taste as good as the stuff that you get in the grocery store when it's in prime. It's just yeah. amazing. Oh, that's so good to hear. <laughs> I, I and it's and it's true. It it has a lot to do with shelf life. The logistics of getting a product that has such a such such a fragile shelf life out of Mexico or Peru and delivering it into our local markets. I mean, good on these guys for 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 doing it. I mean, it's it's that is I can't imagine how difficult that might be. For them sometimes the end result is just kind of like you said you know mm -hmm. lots of times the product isn't fresh because you know it's been on a truck for when we hit in local season it's almost like a different product you know yes. it's 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 fresh it's crunchy typically our, our spear size is much larger than mm -hmm. than peruvian or mexican asparagus so but yeah, let's keep spreading the good word about asparagus. I... It's, it's one of my favorite vegetables when it's in season, and I, I don't take it for granted that I'm in Ontario. So, but um, to that, I'd actually I, I wanted to actually know how asparagus is grown. I did see a picture. We, it might go to a little part of the conversation that I know that we had a very late snowfall this one time this year and I remember you showing a picture <laughs> of like snow and asparagus and I was looking at the date of the picture and I'm thinking it's from like last year and I'm like oh my god this is from like this week <laughs> so yep. I wanted that to was, know that was my dad so he, he took that picture and um we actually had spears out of the ground late April and that's sometimes good because you can go and harvest it get the early market price and people go crazy over it uh, I think it was like half a foot of snow yeah and i have i've never seen it um where it's where it's like that where you know their spears up and then there's a blanket of snow covering the spears it was yeah that that was a very interesting day i can imagine and but to go back though, I kind of fault on my end. I kind of skipped ahead to talking about the snow story, but would you no, just okay. be able to walk me a little through about how asparagus is grown? I know that spheres come out of the ground, but I'm not too much familiar with anything else. So could you maybe talk about that? Yeah, for sure. So we, we go in, we plant for the direct seed, we grow these plants into crowns, we transplant, dig them up. And, and you can fire these crowns in, into rows. You get your roots in the ground. After that, you have to wait three years before you harvest. And that's something a lot of people aren't aware of. You cannot go out and harvest anything. Some, some guys go out in their third year and do a light harvest, but um, uh -huh. it, it is definitely a long-term investment. So you wait your, th your three years, and in those three years, you're uh, taking care of that plant as best as you possibly can, because first years of, of development are very, very important for that, for your long-term health. So you need to nurture these young plants. Um, you got to hit it with water, make sure it's getting the right nutrients, spraying it. And uh, so after your third year, you can start harvesting in, in, in Ontario and most of Canada. Actually, the harvest season is May and June. The lifespan of an asparagus plant is about 20 years if treated correctly. And that's another um, wow. piece of information that a lot of people aren't aware of. So I wanted to go back to what we had talked about earlier in the conversation in terms of I'm someone who is from suburbia. And one of the reasons I'm doing this podcast is because I want to share with more people about these careers in this industry. And for someone I find me who doesn't have roots in agriculture, it might be harder for me to just step into something new. So I, I wanted to know why you should, you think that young people should consider a career in agriculture, even if they don't come from this agricultural yeah. background. Absolutely. So I feel like it is such a rewarding uh, industry to be in. And lots of people, even working in, in the industry, don't don't maybe recognize that you, you're really like you're feeding people healthy food you're you're giving them access to healthy food you're contributing positively to society in a way where you're enhancing people's lives so that is that is such a great reason to to join a, a job or or to be involved in some as far as like you know how do you get into it 
get a get a degree in agronomy or, or, or a food safety degree or, or a food scientist degree like like you know like yourself farmers are looking for food safety coordinators lab technicians scouts on their field even engineers we just recently hired a, a mechanical engineer to oversee our, our our plan operations um robots like we have four robots on our floor we've got these crazy cool pieces of equipment that great asparagus they're out of germany these pieces of equipment they're able to literally take pictures of like like six to eight pictures of every sphere getting passed through that machine that computer decides okay this it's this grade that then so i'm going to drop it at this outlet sort of thing there is so much technology within agriculture right now and i feel like we're, we're kind of experiencing a technological revolution within agriculture so don't think that you know a job in agriculture even even in food 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 factories i mean it's exciting because there's 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 so much new and cool stuff happening we're trying to get robots out in our fields and there are a few prototypes where you know the technology is that they're using lasers to act to, to kill weeds i mean if we can do yeah. that we can get rid of some of the herbicides that we use and, and kind of move more towards that organic side of things. So, um, but really, I mean, anyone with the right attitude, with the right work ethic can be involved in, in the agriculture industry. Apply to work on a farm, there's, there's tons of businesses like mine looking for people to work. Farmers, farms are experiencing labor shortages. So uh, apply today. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, if they hear the podcast, here you go, everyone. We've touched upon about why the agricultural place is a great place to work and those yeah. types of things. So um, I'm trying to think where I want to get to this conversation. Well, for me, I got to pop in my head is for asparagus. We've talked about how it grows, all these types of things, how good it tastes, but how is the best way to eat your asparagus? How, oh. how should I do it if I get it? Okay, here we go. Um, number one, you have to go find the biggest asparagus, the largest diameter asparagus you can find at the grocery store. There is a common misconception in society where people think that a large diameter asparagus is woody, not tender, not sweet. It is, is totally wrong. The larger diameter asparagus is sweeter. Tenderness has to do with freshness. It's nothing to do with diameter. So if, you, if, if you're getting it locally, it's going to be fresh, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so go out and grab those big jumbo asparagus from the shelf and then throw it on the grill. That's the best way. Olive oil, garlic, grilling asparagus is my, by far and away, my favorite way of eating it. So there you go. Well, you just blew some of my misconceptions because there I'll be honest, hopefully... I'm on that, I'm on that camp. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully some of your listeners, uh, I can. I can, you know, sway toward the large diameters. Uh, we are coming to the end of our conversation. So before I go, I do want to ask you two questions. Well, three, maybe we could yeah. say. Um, with the first one being, I always like to ask our guests, what piece of advice would you give to a young person who wants to go into the agricultural industry or maybe work in your field? <sighs> hmm. Or it could be general life advice. You pick. <laughs> okay. Don't give up. I mean, you're going to face so many challenges in your life. And, and there's always a way to, to figure out uh, that problem. And, and it's about solution-based thinking. I mean, if, if you can, it's the difference between saying, you know, this is a problem, period, to this is a problem, but, but, but here are some potential solutions. And, and, and that is something that I encourage my staff to do every day in life. You know, if, if you can be solution based in your thinking, you're going to succeed. I think that's great advice. And I think that it's something that we all need to hear, especially me sometimes. So thank you for sharing that. And I hope everyone takes it. <laughs> and. The last two questions I'll ask you, they're kind of intertwined, but first one being, where can we find Sandy Shore Farms produce if we wanted to purchase some? And where can we find you? 
uh, we ship into all the major retailers, you know, in, in, in Canada, so coast to coast. So in May and June, make sure that you're going to retail and looking for that local asparagus. But as far as, as how to, how to find me and how to connect with me, connect with me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is, it, it's my absolute favorite tool in business, in my business right now. I love connecting. I mean, the reason that you and I are talking today is, is because of LinkedIn. That is um, true. There, there's so many, and maybe this kind of goes back to like my, what I want to say to, to people who want to work in the food industry. Well, get on LinkedIn, create your resume and start connecting with people. It's, it's crazy. Uh, the people that you can connect with, it used to, it didn't used to be like this. You'd have to like phone and, 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 and go through brokers to find buyers and, and now you can, with a few keystrokes, you can search different businesses. You can connect with people that you have never been able to connect with otherwise. It, it's great. I, I feel like I'm, it's like a LinkedIn commercial right now. <laughs> hey, that's what I hear most people say. Like all my guests, there was like LinkedIn, LinkedIn. And I got to agree. It's amazing how much the world has opened up to, like, I feel like I can connect with people and it's just LinkedIn. So it's. Yeah, there you yeah. go, people. It'll be in the show notes. I'll make sure that you can connect to Mark. Yeah. If you so wish so. Please do. I'd love to meet new people. So I love it. Well, with that, thank you so much, Mark, for coming on this show. I just, this conversation just got me so excited about just learning more. And I do feel a little step closer to knowing more and knowing that even if I, I graduate, if I choose to go so in the agriculture, they need people like me. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. It's been my pleasure. I'm happy to do it. That was episode 29 of the Food Grads podcast. All the notes to this podcast can be found on the Food Grads blog or by clicking the Student and Grads tab on the homepage. There you can find any notes to past or future episodes. Do you know anyone you would like me to interview on the show? Perhaps yourself or a specific career path you would like me to explore? then reach out and let me know. You can email me at veronica at foodgrads.com or any of their food grads social media channels. Hope to hear from you. I really enjoy this conversation with Mark because he is a great storyteller. So many times through the conversation, I could just visualize in my head the people and stories he was talking about. I'm really happy I could share this with others and I'm so grateful to farmers for keeping us fed. This was just another reminder of that. Anyways, that's it for this week's episode. Thank you everyone so much for listening and I will see you next time.